This video was an idea by my wonderful friends at Patreon, without whom I could not continue this project as I do. For any newcomers, I usually do a top 10 list of astronomical discoveries of the year. But this year, James Webb so overwhelmed everything else that it made sense to just lump all the pertinent material together and leave the rest for a separate video. There's quite a lot to get through, and I have no idea how many videos this year will take. On the plus side, I suppose it means I won't be running out of topics for a while. So, let's get reacquainted with astronomy's latest workhorse. Ah, the Hubble tension. Such an innocuous phrase. Kind of sounds like a gym routine. Thanks for spotting me, Jimmy. Now I'm off to do 40 reps of Hubble tension. It's what science papers are insisting we call the mismatch between the age of the universe as determined by the Hubble telescope and the cosmic distance ladder currently about 13.8 billion years, and that determined by observations of the cosmic microwave background, currently about 14.3 billion years. The term is something of a face-saving misnomer. Tension is science code for a problem with an obvious solution, and there are no obvious solutions to this problem. Thus, many instead refer to it by the far more accurate moniker, the crisis in cosmology. You may remember that I made a particularly long video outlining the issue in 2019, which I very much encourage you to watch again. Link up there. As the interim has done little to resolve it, and indeed has only seen it worsen. To recap, the traditional method for determining the age of the universe is to employ the cosmic distance ladder, a series of overlapping yardsticks to fix the positions of certain objects. For nearby objects, the most certain method is parallax, the apparent shift in position by an astronomical object as we view it first on one side of the sun and then another. This is the same effect you observe when you view a pencil in your hand with one eye and then another. Except in astronomy, the difference is microscopic. Astronomers believe that, once processed, images from the Gaia probe will reveal parallaxes of 0 0.025 milliarc seconds or the width of a human hair from a thousand kilometers away. Parallax remains the only direct way to measure interstellar distances. But remarkable as it is, parallax can only determine distances up to 10,000 light years, which is less than a thirtieth the width of our own galaxy. The next rung on the ladder is Cepheid variables. Cepheid variables are gigantic, superluminous stars that pulsate to a rhythm directly proportional to their brightness. By counting the rhythm, one can determine how bright a Cepheid variable is, and thus, how far away it is. This makes it what astronomers call a standard candle. Cepheid variables are bright enough to be measured out to 56 million light years, or about the distance to the Virgo cluster, the gravitational center of our local supercluster of galaxies. The next, and currently final step, is type 1a supernovae. A type 1a supernova is when a white dwarf orbits a still living star, gradually siphoning off its material until, upon reaching a specific critical mass, it explodes in a supernova. Because that critical mass is always the same, all type 1a supernovae possess the same brightness. The farthest type 1a supernova measured to date is about 16.5 billion light years away. In the 1920s, an astronomer named Edwin Hubble by studying redshift, the Doppler shift of light caused by movement away from the viewer, realized that the farther away a galaxy was, the faster it was moving. This relationship could only be true if the universe was expanding at a constant rate. Thus, if one could measure the speed at which the universe was expanding, one could then wind back the expansion to the point at which it began, the so-called Big Bang. By 2019, the time of my last video on this subject, the best measurement the distance ladder had attained for the age of the universe, using the Hubble Space Telescope, was 13.8 billion years. But the 21st century saw the arrival of a means to check that number. The cosmic microwave background is the universe-wide fading echo of the Big Bang, and represents a fossil imprint of the universe when it was just 370,000 years old. The universe at that time was essentially one giant star, a seething, 
roiling, blindingly bright, opaque surface. And the motions of that surface are frozen into the cosmic microwave background. With the most modern tools, it is possible to observe great shock waves across the face of the infinite universe, left frozen into the cosmic microwave background. Because the speed of sound, and thus the speed of any shock wave, can be calculated from the density of its medium, the physical size of these oscillations, and thus their distance from the eye, can be directly measured. And they say the universe is 14.3 billion years old. A difference of less than 5% may not seem like much, and indeed before the microwave background result was announced, arguably would not have been. But the error bars simply did not overlap, and subsequent observations have only made things worse. The James Webb Space Telescope was hyped as Hubble's successor. Since Hubble's primary job was to lock down the age of the universe, you would expect James Webb to assume the mantle and resolve the situation. It did not. One of the possible solutions to the issue involved whether Cepheid variables were biased bright. In other words, whether the Hubble telescope had insufficient resolution to determine if a Cepheid variable truly was as bright as it appeared, or whether its brightness was augmented by, say, another nearby star. This year, a study headed by Adam Rees, the man who won a Nobel Prize for discovering what we now call dark energy, showed that whatever was causing the discrepancy, it wasn't because Hubble had biased Cepheid variables. James Webb showed that, at least for three galaxies, the difference between the calculations of the Hubble constant between the Hubble and James Webb telescopes amounts to just 0.02 orders of magnitude, which, if my notoriously lacking math skills are anything to go by, means 20%, a negligible difference in the scales we're talking about. One can only hope that the James Webb proves more avant-garde in future. Another possible solution to the Hubble tension involves another topic I discussed in my 2020 retrospective, is our position in the universe unique or typical? Evidence has been piling up for years that, contrary to scientific orthodoxy, which holds that at the grandest scale, our universe is isotropic and homogeneous. In other words, from a God's eye view, it appears similar in all directions. Our position in the universe is in fact in view of some very heterogeneous and complex structures. One such structure is the so-called local whole, or Keenan Barger Cowrie Supervoid, an underdensity of material in our galactic neighborhood believed to be roughly 2 billion light years across. This year, a team headed by scientists from the universities of Bonn and St Andrews in Scotland found that the gravitational attraction of the walls of the supervoid may pull local galaxies toward them 10% faster than the rate predicted by the standard model, thus explaining the discrepancy between local galaxy speeds and the cosmic microwave background. Except there's a problem. The solution only works if one abandons Einsteinian relativity in favor of that cantankerous contrarian MOND, or Modified Newtonian Dynamics, which says that, at galactic scales, rather than weakening exponentially, as gravity is predicted to do, it suddenly, inexplicably, begins weakening linearly. MOND was first proposed as an alternative to dark matter and is widely regarded by astrophysicists as flimsy and ad hoc, largely because, well, it is. Of course, that doesn't mean it isn't right, but no one will even consider employing it until such time as dark matter is finally disproven for good. And there's another problem. You may have heard a while back that our galaxy lies at the tail end of a gigantic flowing river of a hundred thousand galaxies called Laniakea, a troop of mice all dancing toward a gigantic invisible monster called the Great Attractor. The gravitational motions of our local galaxies bias our measurements of the universe's expansion somewhat, as they can be tugged any which way, and many, such as Andromeda, are even moving towards us. On a local scale, these biases can be dealt with, but at the scale of Laniakea, the influences are less clear. Until November this year, when a study by a team of astronomers in Italy and Australia concluded that the gravitational interference of Laniakea was indeed affecting the Hubble tension by reducing it. It turns out that once the gravitational pull of Laniakea was accounted for, 
the Hubble tension is in fact 2-3% to larger than originally thought. So, it seems we're both near a giant void, and the Hubble tension is explained, with the aid of some iffy physics, and part of a gargantuan galactic superstructure, and the Hubble tension is worse. One presumably solid means of resolving the issue would be to find an alternative yardstick that didn't rely on any established method. In my 2020 retrospective, I discussed attempts at not only the traditional means of determining the rate of the universe's expansion, the distance ladder and the cosmic microwave background, but also novel methods such as water masers and gravitational lensing. All produced results that either agreed with the smaller measurement or with the larger. But this year, a study by a graduate student at the Cosmic Dawn Center in Copenhagen produced an entirely new standard candle. When two neutron stars, or a neutron star and a black hole, come together, the result is known as a kilonova, so called because, while they are smaller than supernovae, they are still a thousand times more powerful than regular novae. For the record, a nova, minus the super, is an eruption of fusing material from the surface of a white dwarf orbiting a star. Basically a type 1a supernova, just not strong enough to blow it apart. Kilonovae, it turns out, possess a very uniform spectrum, which enables astronomers to calculate their luminosity, making them ideal standard candles. Albert Schneppen, the student who proposed the idea, tested it on a recently discovered kilonova and found that it agreed, somewhat, with the cosmic microwave background. Another, strikingly original idea, proposed this year, involved the accretion disks around black holes. Black hole accretion disks are some of the brightest light sources in the universe. Quasars, the accretion disks around supermassive black holes at the hearts of early galaxies, can be seen across billions of light years and were one of the first indications that our universe had evolved since the dawn of time. They also occur, on a smaller scale, in our own galaxy. The first identified black hole, Cygnus X1, possesses not only an accretion disk, but a jet similar to, though far smaller than, that emanating from the famous supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy M87. Black holes are unique in that they do not reflect light. All other objects in the universe, regardless of brightness, do reflect light. Even our own sun reflects some of the light from its orbiting planets, minuscule though it is compared to the light the sun emits. Cygnus X1's accretion disk, while certainly emitting copious amounts of light, also reflects the light from its escaping jet, and the time it takes the reflected light to travel the distance of the disk can be measured. That time gives us an accurate figure for the size of the disk and from that, its intrinsic luminosity. If this technique could be scaled up to supermassive black holes, then it could become a powerful tool for determining the universe's expansion. Perhaps ultimately what is needed is to go back to the drawing board. If observations aren't filling the gaps, maybe we need to toss out everything and re-examine the theory. Well, in September, a pair of physicists in the journal Physics Review attempted just that employing statistical tools to determine the likelihood of various models in which dark energy, the driving force of cosmic expansion, varies with time. The result? None of them came close to resolving the Hubble tension. When even theory is laughing at you, you know the road ahead is hard. But the Hubble tension isn't the only puzzling proof of precocity the universe threw at us this year. Another of the James Webb's goals was to use its cosmos-spanning eye to observe galactic evolution. Because the speed of light is finite, the farther you look into the distance, the further you see back in time. And James Webb can see into an era when the structures of our universe were still coming together. At the start of the year, a study in nature astronomy found that six of the earliest galaxies observed by James Webb were above 10 billion solar masses in size, or about 150th the size of the Milky Way. This is far more massive than predicted for galaxies of their estimated age, having formed between 500 million and 700 million years after the Big Bang. For galaxies to form so many stars in such a short time, they would need to convert 100% of their gas into stars, compared with just 10% for a modern galaxy. 
But for all the hoo-ha in the press about Webb disproving the Big Bang, in October, a team of researchers in Ireland and Georgia Tech ran a high-resolution simulation of the early universe and found that, by factoring in dark matter and population three stars, gigantic stars believed to have existed in the first years of the universe, it did not conflict with James Webb's observations. Also in October, a Canada-led team of astronomers concluded by studying distant galaxies known to be gravitationally lensed to appear brighter than they were, that the early reports of over-evolved galaxies were due either to a misreading of the spectrograph that made the galaxies appear farther away, or to simple bias. Also, a team at Northwestern University in the U.S. used a combination of James Webb data and simulations to show that, while modern star formation in large galaxies like our own occurs at a stately, even rate, Star formation in smaller galaxies, which dominated in the early universe, tends to occur in rapid bursts, then cease for long periods. The team believes this is because the galaxy's lower gravity causes supernovae to blast hydrogen into the outer halo, only for it to fall back later. This could therefore explain why early galaxies appear bright, despite their lower mass. This in turn meant that those galaxies need not have been as massive as initially supposed. But the universe has revealed its early maturity in other ways. In September, a team from the University of Bonn employed gravitational lensing and James Webb to observe El Gordo, a gigantic galaxy cluster at a redshift of 0.87, which places it about 10 billion light years away in space and about 7 billion years in time, or about halfway to the Big Bang. I may have undersold El Gordo by calling it gigantic. Its mass is estimated to be 2.1 quadrillion solar masses, roughly analogous to our own Virgo supercluster. Thing is, according to our understanding of how the universe works, a cluster that early shouldn't be that big. More to the point, it also shouldn't be colliding with another cluster at 2,600 kilometers per second, which is what the study estimated its infall velocity to be. And it isn't even the only cluster moving at such speeds. There is, as yet, no simple way to explain this. It's just another observation showing that our grasp of the universe is weaker than we sometimes want to believe. Also in September, a Canadian-British team conducted a census of 3,956 galaxies found by James Webb, the largest taken to date, from redshift 1.5, about 9.5 billion years ago, to redshift 6.5, about 13 billion years ago. They found that, far from the dwarf irregular galaxies believed to dominate before Redshift 3, instead, the majority of galaxies above 10 billion solar masses were fully mature spirals. Previous observations with the Hubble telescope had suggested they would be only a tenth as common. They had assumed this was due to the violence of mergers, which were far more common in the early universe, destroying their delicate spiral structures. But according to the team, their findings are in accordance with several simulations. In May, a team at the University of Edinburgh identified a galaxy at redshift 4.6, corresponding to a distance of roughly 25 billion light years, and an age of roughly 1.3 billion years after the Big Bang, to be the oldest quiescent galaxy ever discovered. The galaxy, GS9209, is, or was, about a tenth the size of the Milky Way, and topped out at around 40 billion solar masses. But what has surprised the team about this galaxy is that it had already ceased to form new stars. In astronomical terms, it was quenched and already degenerating. That this could occur less than 2 billion years after the Big Bang, particularly given that our own galaxy is 12 billion years old and still ticking, is perplexing, to say the least. But astronomers think they have a culprit. GS929 has a supermassive black hole five times larger than expected for a galaxy its size. Supermassive black holes, in their angry early years, generate gigantic amounts of radiation, which, in a galaxy as small as GS9209, is strong enough to blow all star-forming gas into intergalactic space, rendering it sterile. Here's hoping that, later in life, GS joined up with a nicer, calmer galaxy and got its groove back. In November, a Cambridge-led team used Webb 
to make the farthest ever spectral determination of a galaxy's distance, at redshift 12.5, corresponding to a distance of 33 billion light years and an age of less than 350 million years after the Big Bang. We are farther from the evolution of sharks than this galaxy is from the birth of the universe. What shocked the team was that the spectral lines included the signal for carbon, an element that only forms in the cores of stars nearing the ends of their lives. However ancient this star was, it was not one of the first stars born, as other stars had to die to gift it with carbon. These progenitors are likely to be the first stars ever formed, the fabled and still unobserved Population 3. Speaking of carbon, in June, a European team of astronomers, while studying protoplanetary disks in the Orion Nebula, detected the first evidence of the methyl cation in interstellar space. The methyl cation, basically methane minus one hydrogen atom, is one of the simplest carbon molecules. But like any combination of the big four elements, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen, could be a stepping stone to life. This is somewhat complicated by the fact that the protoplanetary disk it was found in has shown no sign of water. In July, a study by the University of Cambridge found that James Webb may have identified polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons at redshift 7, a distance equivalent to within the first billion years after the Big Bang. These are the same muddy carbonic materials that were seen as possible biosignatures in the Allen Hills Martian meteorite all those years ago. This is surprising because to form such complex structures in space is believed to take hundreds of millions of years. It is possible that the spectral signature indicates a less complex carbon molecule, and this is the working assumption of the Cambridge team. But either way, it shows that galaxies evolve far more quickly than previously thought. A similar conclusion was reached by a team at the National Astronomical University of Japan when they employed James Webb to track the development of a similarly human-important element, oxygen. By conducting a survey of 138 distant galaxies, they found that oxygen in the universe had reached its current level within 700 million years of the Big Bang. These two discoveries together show that the chemical basis for life was present even just after the dawn of time. In October, a Northwestern University-led team conducted a survey of 33 teenage galaxies at redshift 2 to 3, or 2 to 3 billion years after the Big Bang. Within these young galaxies, alongside such standard stardust as nitrogen, oxygen, silicon, and sulfur, was the presence of nickel. Nickel is heavier than iron. It cannot form as part of a star's life cycle. In fact, it only forms during type 1a supernovae. To be visible at interstellar distances, it must be present in high enough quantities to register on a spectrum, an event rare even from nearby galaxies, once again showing that the universe was up and running earlier than we had assumed. Conversely, in September, a joint Danish and Australian team employed Webb to observe patterns of star formation in the early universe and found, to their shock, the, the rules the universe had been following for 12 billion years didn't apply in the earliest times. Galaxies in the earliest eon of the universe had up to four times fewer heavy elements, nickel included presumably, than those preceding them. Since it is highly unlikely that the laws of physics differed back then, the team concluded that the difference must be because early galaxies interacted far more intensely with the mist of hydrogen still suffusing the universe gobbling fuel and diluting their heavier elements. But James Webb did more than just mark the universe's height on a wall this year. In February, a team at the University of Stockholm used a combination of James Webb and gravitational lensing to view the internal structure of galaxies born just 680 million years after the Big Bang. They found that the farther back one looked, the more concentrated the internal structure was into so-called clumps clusters of stars denser than any found in the modern universe. These clumps have been known for a while, but their precise evolution has been difficult to pin down. The team were able to show that, within roughly a billion years, these clumps dispersed into the disks of young galaxies, 
possibly forming into globular clusters. In March, an Italian-led team employed James Webb to answer one of the most glaring, literally, questions about the origin of the universe. Our universe was born in three bursts of light. The first, the Big Bang, lasted less than a second. 370,000 years later came the decoupling, when photons could finally travel outside atoms, and the universe shifted from an ionized plasma, like a star, to normal neutral matter. Finally, a hundred million years later, came the birth and ignition of the first stars. Astronomers refer to this time as the era of reionization because it was when matter, principally hydrogen and helium gas, shifted again from being electrically neutral to being ionized. Today, almost all the matter in the universe, even that not in stars, is electrically charged. Astronomers had long assumed that the birth of stars and the reionization of the remaining matter were linked, but could never prove it. The radiation from the earliest galaxies, which would have caused ionization, is absorbed by light years and eons of dust in the way. But by using James Webb, the team were able to estimate the amount of star formation in these early galaxies, and from that, extrapolate the amount of radiation they leaked into the wider universe. They found that the amount of leaked radiation was 12%, which, while paltry on its own, when combined with the sheer number of early galaxies, is enough to explain reionization. The results are not conclusive. They rest on a great many assumptions. But even a rough draft is still part of the story. In August, one of the first far galaxies found by James Webb had its distance confirmed spectrographically, and was found to be at redshift 11.4, which corresponds to a distance of roughly 32 billion light years and an age of 390 million years after the Big Bang. That's about a quarter of a percent the age of the universe. The use of a spectrograph allows for a precise calculation of a galaxy's redshift and thus its distance. Named Maisie's galaxy after its discoverer's daughter, the galaxy, like many galaxies of its era, is small, compact, and bursting with star formation to the point that its redshift was much bluer than initially predicted. Also in August, a team led by Lucas Furtak of Ben-Gurion University in Israel echoed one of the great achievements of 2022 by employing a combination of the Webb telescope and gravitational lensing to catch a star in a distant galaxy. While that previous star, known as Arendelle, remains the farthest star ever observed, at redshift 6.2, this new star, with the far less catchy name of Max 0647 star 1, still lies at an impressive 4.76. As with Arendelle, there is some debate as to whether this star is alone or part of a pair or group. It might be a hot blue supergiant star reddened by a passing dust cloud, or perhaps orbited by a smaller F-type star, more similar to our sun. In November, a team of astronomers at Penn State announced that Webb had located the second and fourth most distant galaxies ever found. Unearthed in a deep field image taken by James Webb in February, the two galaxies are both beyond redshift 12, or 33 billion light years from Earth, a distance corresponding to about 367 million years after the Big Bang. The farther galaxy was tentatively placed at redshift 13, or 328 million years after the Big Bang. They are both small, about 1% the size of our galaxy, though the nearer one is slightly larger, and both are larger than other galaxies found at this distance. Redshift 12, like the galaxy observed by the Stockholm team, is clumpy, showing intense star formation. Also in November, Dr. Anshu Gupta of Curtin University in Australia, utilizing web data, found that early galaxies, those beyond Redshift 6, or less than a billion years after the Big Bang, were suffused with gas that was incandescent with the light from early stars. This abundance of gas is likely due to galaxy merging, which was more common in the early years of the universe, thanks partly to its smaller size. The James Webb Space Telescope has an uncertain future. It is literally a million miles from Earth. When it fails, there will be no saving it it will become another dead spacecraft, drifting into orbit around the sun. I hope 
during this brief spark of life, it will solve the mysteries it reveals.